And welcome back to the world tonight. Earlier this month, more than 50 Democratic lawmakers left Texas to block a vote on GOP-led legislation that would create harsher voter ID requirements, ban 24-hour and drive-through voting, and stop election officials from sending voters unsolicited absentee ballots. The Reverend William J. Barber II and former Texas Representative Beto O'Rourke launched a four-day, 27-mile march in Texas against voter suppression today, calling on Congress to end the filibuster and pass voting rights legislation. Reverend Barber joins us now to talk about his ongoing march and other efforts to support not only voting rights, but poor people throughout America. We are happy you could join us today, sir. Thank you for being a part of today's program of the world tonight. You know, one pastor involved in the march that you're now undertaking in Texas describes your march as, quote, our Selma moment. Do you agree with that statement? And what are your thoughts as you move forward with this march? Well, first of all, thank you. And there's certainly comparisons. I would like to say that it was the Poor People's Campaign in Texas that called for this march. And they invited me to come in along with my co-chair, Reverend Dr. Liz Steele Harris. And there are about 40 organizations that have been involved. And of course, our brother Beto's organization was one of them. But I don't want to dismiss all of the people who made this possible. We know we have to nationalize what's happening in Texas. Texas is the canary in the mine. Because the attempt by the legislature here is to retrogress voting rights laws. We can't litigate ourselves out of this because it takes too long. And even the, if the state passes this, then they can use federal, uh, state tax dollars uh, uh, to defend the case. We can't mobilize beyond it because the very laws that they are putting in place is to decrease mobilization. So we have to have federal help. And that's what the march from Selma to Montgomery said. It said we had to have a federal voting rights act. Today, we must have the For the People's Act that John Lewis wrote in his dying days, uh, it would make illegal the things that this legislature and 18 others around the country are trying to do. Um, and, that, and that's something that has to happen. And so we're nationalizing Texas as Dr. King and others nationalized Alabama. Now, the difference is, this is we're not fighting Jim Crow. We're fighting James Crow Esquire. And that's why when you look at this crowd, you'll see a great diversity. Because the bills these folk are passing will hurt black people, white people, Latino people, Asian people, native people, poor people, low wealth people, workers, students. It's going to hurt everybody. Certainly race is a part of it, but this is James Crow Esquire. And you have to understand that. And then lastly, the, we have to make the connections. The same people that are suppressing the vote in these state legislatures suppress living wages, suppress health care. They suppress immigrant protection. They suppress protection for the LGBT community. So this is a time we all have to stand up and protect the heart and soul of the democracy. And Reverend Barber, the symbolism of this march is indicative of what you've just talked about of when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis marched from Selma to Montgomery. And it led to the Voting Rights Act uh, being passed in 1965. Do you hope that this march will have the same impact with just as you mentioned the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the For the People Act? And given the fact that the For the People Act even has some Republican measures in there that a lot of Republicans like, yet it still languishes in the Senate. Well, we do. We believe the pressure is starting to push already. We've seen a number of things. You know, we marched on Manchin's office on the 23rd of June. The next morning, he started talking about compromising. He hadn't even said anything about compromising. This week earlier, 39 people were arrested uh, in our national effort in 27 states. Uh, we were arrested in at Cinema's office. She came out with a statement that began to tweak what she had been saying. I just heard today that uh, Senator Warnock pulled folk together um, and said, we've got to do something right now because we've been doing this since July the 12th because we know you don't need a moment, you need a movement. And after this march and a massive rally uh, this coming Saturday, we're then headed back to D.C. where clergy and low-wage workers will once again engage in more direct action uh, on Monday. Last Monday, if you, Monday before last, 100 women from across the country of every race, creed, and color did this. So, so we're very serious about what's happening. But, you know, 
uh, I think we have to connect this. Uh, a couple of things. You know, it was, it was King and, and Lewis, but it was the Dallas Voters League. It was, you know, that march was very diverse. It was two people that had been killed, a black man named James, uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson, and a white man named James Reed. And I like to make those connections because it's when the people stand up. And what they're saying here, and our demands are, by August the 6th, the 56th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act by Lyndon Baines Johnson, we should be ashamed as a nation that 56 years later we have less voting rights than we had on January, June, uh, August 6, 1965. So we're saying in the filibuster, pass the For the People's Act, the John Lewis Bill, that by the way, Manchin signed on to it when McConnell was a leader. The Voting Rights Act restoration hadn't even been written, so you got to pass that when it's written, but it's not been written. Pass uh, $15 minimum wage. Why? Because Dr. King and others understand voting is about power and it's also connected to economic justice. And we know the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is standing against the passing of the For the People Act because they know that will bring more people into the process and cut out dark money. And then lastly, we're saying right. pass a bill tax our immigrants. So we got to do all of this. And we yes, it can be done by August 6th if people are willing to do it. And if not, we're going to intensify our agitation. Reverend Barber, we want you to stay with us. We'll be right back with more of my interview with you here on The World Tonight on BNC on the fight for voting rights, but also the soul of America and how do we heal it. That's next after the break. Welcome back to The World Tonight. I'm talking to the Reverend William Barber, who is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend Barber, in the limited time that I have left, I want to give you the floor, sir, on uh, doing something that you've been striving to do for many, many years, and that is to heal the soul of the nation. The President of the United States is talking about the very thing, and on the heels of George Floyd, as well as the lie about about a fraudulent election, as well as the storming of the Capitol, how do we heal the soul of America against the backdrop of partisan politics and the racial divide in this country? First of all, we got to admit it, that we have a sickness. And then the prescription for the sickness must meet the, the level of the sickness. And we've got to admit that it's more than just the calling of names and the people being divided. We've been a struggling country with, with division. And even the, the violent insurrection we stopped on January 6th, we got to look at the political insurrection that's going on inside of these state houses through these policies. And so we have to say that policy is the prescription. We have to have policies that address systemic racism, and particularly voter suppression. We have to have policies that address poverty and low wealth. Uh, we have to have policies that address uh, health care, the 87 million people being without health care, uninsured, 140 million people poor and low wealth. We have to have policies that change to fa- face climate uh, crisis, policies that say we spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar in the war economy, 16 cents on infrastructure, that's backwards. And we have to have policy that challenges re- uh, ra- religious nationalism and approach these things from a moral uh, and a constitutional perspective. Listen, we don't have a scarcity of resources in this country or a scarcity of ideas. We have a scarcity of moral consciousness. That's why we're marching. That's why religious leaders and people of all races, creeds, and colors are coming together from Appalachia to Alabama, from Texas all the way up to Maine and Michigan to say the people, the people, we must have a mass movement of moral conviction, mass voter registration and participation, we must have meaningful legislation in a progressive way. And when necessary, we must have mass litigation to stop those things that don't ensure equal protection under the law. Our Constitution is very clear. Until we William establish Barber, I want to ju- thank you for spending time to talk to us today. It's very important what you're talking about. And we do need the moral courage and the moral faith to move forward together, just as your shirt says. Thank you so much for joining us. Reverend William Barber. <laughs> 